Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last day of OpenStack Summit Berlin. Uh, my name is Samuel. I work for Intel, and I'm uh, one of the uh, Kata Container uh, member of the architecture, Kata Container Architecture Committee. Um, so I think I can talk about it. Um, and I'm going to give a project update today. Um, Kata Container in a month will be one year old. And so it's a, it's a fairly new project, but um, before Kata Containers, we had Clear Containers and Hyper and RunV. Um, and those two merge into something that's called today Kata Containers. So Kata Containers is one year old, but it's based off two projects that are uh, probably three or four years old. So uh, we created Kata Containers back in December 2017. And we did our first uh, stable release in May 2018. So it, it only took us uh, a few months to go from uh, project inception to the first stable release because we're basing off this project uh, on already stable project. And, and what we did from, the, from December 2017 to the first stable release is actually merging uh, those two projects together. Uh, we didn't have a, a, a lot of features in between the two. We, we really literally spent a lot of time talking and discussing how we could merge the two products together and make the first Kata Containers release. So that happened in May 2018. Um, and this is what back then Kata Containers looked like. Um, I'm not going to go through all the components here. Uh, it's boring and it's not, it's actually, it, it's even more complex than this. So um, yeah, there's, what, what I want to, to highlight here is that there are a, a lot of components. Uh, you, you should compare that to a regular Docker deployment with Run-C, which is just one binary, uh, and one binary and something like containerd on, on top of this. Kata containers, this is replacing one binary. So it's complex. Uh, there's a lot of moving targets. There's a lot of... Uh, I mean, when, you, when we do release, you need to release all these pieces together. You need to make sure that the, the, the CI tested everything. It, it's a complex piece of software. Um, we did the, the, the 1.0 release in May. Um, and since then, we've made um, three other releases. And we're going to make the, the next release, which is 1.4.0, uh, in, in a week or so. Um, but my point with the previous slide was that this is a 1.0, it's stable, it's working. Uh, but we had, back then, many gaps still. And the update I'm going to give today is going to try to explain how we filled those gaps, partially or completely, uh, with the next releases that happened uh, since May 2018. So we had a few gaps. We had the uh, security gaps. Um, security is really the main feature of Kata containers, and still, uh, we always want to improve security with, with Kata Containers. So we want to add more layers of security in the virtual machine that runs Kata Containers outside the virtual machine. We want to make sure that security is still the most um, interesting features of, of Kata Containers. As I said, uh, it's, it's a complex piece of software. So we are also trying to make it simpler. And it's, it's kind of related to security. Uh, the more complex your software is, the more likely it is to be not secure. So making it simple means you can audit it, you can verify that it's, that it, it's not broken, that it's not uh, insecure. Um, performance is also a very uh, important feature for us because we are claiming that we are more secure than uh, regular containers, but we don't want that to happen at the cost of um, being much less performance. So performance is really important. And finally, um, one of the uh, goal of merging clear containers and RunV together into Kata containers was to make sure the world understand that clear containers is not an Intel specific project and RunV is not a Niper specific project. So we want to make sure that we support other architectures, we support other companies, we support other silicon vendors into a multi-architecture project. So those were the main gaps that we had when we released 1.0. And as I said, I'm going to explain what we did to try to fill those gaps uh, during the past year. So in terms of uh, security, <clears throat> as I said, what we're trying to do is adding layers of security 
optionally or not, not, not optionally, uh, inside the virtual machine. So inside the virtual machine, you have the container workload running there. And we want to add more security inside the virtual machine so that if you have a pod with several containers running, you can isolate <laughs> even further your containers within your pod if you think it's necessary. Uh, you can also um, add layers of security like SecComp. So you can do system call filtering and make sure that uh, your container workload is not calling into system calls that it's not supposed to call. Um, if you think about it, it's, if, it, if it does call system calls that it's not supposed to call inside the virtual machine, it's actually not going to harm your, uh, your host. It's just going to harm your guest, but nothing is going to happen on your actual infrastructure. But some people actually really want to make sure that their container workload inside the virtual machine works exactly the same way that it would work outside of Kata container in a regular Docker deployment, for example. So they want to make sure that the system call is not allowed to call on the host. Is it won't call also on, on the guest, on the on the Kata containers virtual machine. So that translates into like this is the diagram, the very high level picture of uh, of a Kata container without SecComp. So your container workload calls directly into the the call switches between between rings. Uh, by uh, sys calling into the kernel, and it, it calls directly there. And with seccomp, you add one additional layer um, in front of the kernel to make sure that uh, the list of system calls that you allow the workload to call are the one that the workload is going to call. So if you if it's trying to call something that you you don't want it to call, um, seccomp would reject that, and and your uh, your workload will get an, an error. So we added that inside the uh, the um, the virtual machine as one additional security layer. Uh, another uh, security feature that we added very recently with 140, well, 140 is not released yet, but it's going to show up with 140, is the support for NEMU. Um, Melissa yesterday at the, during the keynote talked a bit about NEMU, which is a, a very simplified version of QMU, uh, very streamed down um, to a lot less lines of code. Uh, much smaller uh, attack surface. So this is part of the security story of, of Kata Container. We want to support the most secure hypervisor out there. And right now, we believe that NEMU is providing a, a much shorter uh, attack surface than QMU is. So if you want to use um, uh, something that is supposedly more secure than, than QMU uh, as part of your hypervisor, you can do that today with uh, Kata Containers and switch to, to NEMU, which is, as I said, the very trimmed down version of, of QMU. So yeah, with uh, th that's the regular setup. Uh, you have seccomp, you have a QMU below it, and you just reduce your you, uh, your uh, hypervisor attack surface by using NEMU. You still run, you're seeing running KVM, but you're using something that is QMU compatible, uh, but just a lot more smaller. A lot smaller, sorry. Uh, and finally, uh, we now also support Vert Vertire uh, R RNG, which is a way for your container workload to have a much stronger uh, random uh, source, uh, hardware-based from the host. Uh, so that's also adding uh, more security. And that was added with uh, 1.3.0, which is the latest version of Kata Container. Um, <clears throat> we had, um, as I said, complexity. Uh, debugability issues as well, and gaps. Not issues, but gaps. Uh, we thought we, there could be a lot of improvement there, so we did some stuff. Um, we added support for VSOC. Um, who knows what VSOC is here? Yeah. Well, one. Yeah, of course you know. <laughs> <laughs> so VSOC, um, if you look at the, the vanilla uh, Kata container, um, you have a proxy. And this proxy takes all the runtime command, all the shin commands from the upper layers, from uh, Kubernetes, and talks, forwards those commands to, uh, to the virtual machine through a YAMUX interface, which is a, basically a, a, a virtualized serial interface. Um, and because it's a serial interface, we need a proxy. So the proxy is taking many gRPC commands from, from the runtime, from the shims, and I'm not going to go into details into what those are, but really the idea is that you're getting a lot of gRPC commands and you want to stuff that into a serial uh, interface, even though it's a, it's a virtual serial interface, it's still a serial interface. Uh, 
So you need to proxy that, and you need to multiplex, demultiplex all your gRPC commands through a serial interface. And what we did uh, uh, with VSOC, VSOC is a way to do virtualized sockets. So instead of having a serial interface uh, to take all your gRPC command, your virtual machine is going to provide a socket-based uh, interface. So you can have basically a, a, a gRPC server running on your, on your virtual machine, and you don't need a proxy anymore. So that's one way of removing one of the many components of, of, uh, of CADA containers, uh, namely the proxy. And it just simplifies everything. You just calls directly. You do, all your components talk directly to the virtual machine through uh, the VSOC uh, interface. With 1.4.0, we're going to have a, a, a very interesting feature, which is uh, distributed tracing. Uh, when you have so many components, which is the shim, the runtime, the agent inside the virtual machine, the proxy if you're not using VSOC. Um, debugging the whole thing is actually proved to be quite difficult. You get logs from all the components, and you need to make sense if you want to get the big picture of what's happening. So we added support for open tracing with uh, 140, all the way from the agent to, to the runtime. So we will be able to basically see something like this. It's, this is not a, a Kata container. A, uh, uh, screenshot or anything, but it, that's the idea. You're going to have a, a big picture of what's happening in Kata container when you run uh, a, a pod, when you when you do anything with Kubernetes. You can trace that from top to bottom, and you can have a, a real good understanding of what's happening through all the components, whereas looking at each component individually and, and trying to understand how they interact together. So that's a that's a very interesting features, uh, a very interesting feature for debugging, but also for uh, performance reasons. So, we will be able to say when we start a Kata containers and it takes 1.1 second, we will be able to know where those 1.1 seconds are are actually spent, and we will be able to say, oh, this is this is where we should be working because if we want to reduce this this uh, this startup time, so it's uh, it's it's both a um, Debugging tool, but also a, a performance uh, improvement tool. Um, live upgrade is also uh, um, an interesting feature. It's it's not going to be make it to one four zero. We hope it's going to make it to one five zero. Um, and this is a, a more of an operation uh, feature uh, when you want to do live upgrade of your uh, Kata container infrastructure. So this is this is something that people actually running Kata containers in production are looking for, and it's a it's a very interesting feature for them. Um, last but not least, uh, if you remember that picture, you probably don't, but uh, you see that uh, in the virtual machine we have two containers running. We have one container and one container exec, which is basically when you do a, a Docker exec or a, a, a control exec, when you want to execute another uh, command inside your pod, that actually creates a new container and you, does an execution of the, of the new command. When you do this, you end up with having to run two shims on the host. And when you run a pod with five containers, you're going to have five shims on the host. And if you want to exec some commands into those five containers, you're going to have five plus five shims. So shims adds up, and complexity adds up, and security is lower as, as you get more and more shims. And so the idea with um, container shim, container shim v2 is to have one shim per pod. So you can have as many, as many containers as you want inside your pod. You're always going to have one single shim that handles everything inside the pod. So that's a, uh, we put it in the complexity section, but it's, uh, to me, it's also a security uh, improvement uh, feature where you, you, you're simpler. You don't have to monitor uh, that many components, and your code is very centralized into, into one piece of, of, of binary. Uh, performance. As I said, uh, performance is really important to us. Um, we, we're providing security uh, through Kata containers, and when people realize the value that Kata containers provide, the next question is, what's the overhead? Uh, what, what, is, what am I going to pay for, for getting this, this, uh, this added security? And the answer is, I mean, we, we don't have like a, a, you know, one answer for this, but uh, 
you are going to pay for you are going to pay for this added security. You got, you're going to have a memory overhead. You're going to have uh, your startup uh, your startup time that is slightly higher than than your regular container. Um, it's bearable, and for for most of the use cases, it doesn't really matter. But we want to make sure that this stays as is, and we want to make sure that we can improve this. So we want to make sure that boot time is reduced, uh, is getting as close as possible to the regular container boot time, uh, and, and so on. One thing that we did for, uh, uh, for improving performance is uh, VM templating. So that was added in 1.2.0. It's an interesting feature where when you start a, a, a VM, a virtual machine, or, well, Kata container is a virtual machine, so when we start a, a Kata container, we do start a virtual machine from, from zero, from scratch. So we have a, a, what we call the cold VM boot time. And this is really starting, creating, and, and launching the virtual machine. And what VM templating does is, at some point of the boot process, we do a VM snapshot, a VM template, and we use that template to create new virtual machine after that. And this reduces the, the boot time significantly, and overall reduces the Kata container startup time. So in the big scheme of things, when you start a container with, uh, with Kubernetes, by th between the time you press the button in your uh, Kubernetes dashboard and the time that the container workload is actually accessible, uh, it's going to cost you at least several seconds in the best case. Uh, most of the time, it's 15, 20 seconds. Um, Kata Continuous consumes today uh, around one second out of this, and we're trying to improve this. Um, so it's one second out of 20. It's not a lot. It's almost noise in the, the overall Kubernetes startup time, but it's still something that we want to improve. We, we don't want to um, assume that people don't care about this because Kubernetes takes that much longer. So it's really important for us to make sure that uh, our boot time are always reduced. Um, they never increase um, out of control. And so this is the kind of features that we are pushing into, into Kata containers. Uh, TC mirroring, um, traffic control mirroring, uh, just, um, I'm just going to make an, an explanation of, of why we need TC mirroring, and uh, you may not know what TC mirroring is. Um, as I said in the previous session, if you were there, and I see some of you guys are here from the previous session, um, when you do networking with Kata containers, um, you basically having a virtual machine with all the virtual machine networking assumption talking to the container ecosystem networking assumption. So the container ecosystem and the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem is using CNI, which is a networking interface. Uh, you have a lot of different CNI implementation for depending on the network you want to build with, uh, with Kubernetes. But all those plugins, all those CNI plugins, which are binaries that, that actually create your, your, your software networking, uh, all those make an assumption on the kind of interface that they're going to talk to. They assume that they're going to talk to a container-specific interface, which is typically a, a, a virtual Ethernet interface, a VETH. They assume that they're going to talk to one end of a VETH, and the other end is, is basically linked to the host. And when you have one end of a VETH and you're trying to make that talk to a virtual machine, it just doesn't work. The vir virtual machine world is not VETH-aware. Uh, we're trying to fix that. But in the meantime, we need to bridge those two worlds. Um, the virtual machine interface is ex typically expecting a tap interface. And so on one hand, you have a tap interface. On one hand, and on the other hand, we have a, a VETH interface. And what we tr we're doing with Kata Containers is building a bridge between those two. So we have several implementations. We have uh, a MACV tap-based implementation, IP VLAN uh, implementation. We have a, we, you can also do just regular Linux bridges. Um, and TC mirroring is another uh, way of um, bridging those two. So depending on the, the kind of networking you want to do, depending on the performance you want to you reach, you may want to select one of those three implementations. Uh, so TC mirroring is not the default implementation yet. Uh, we're considering switching to it as the default implementation for bridging networking between the Kata containers virtual machine and the container host, and the, and the host, sorry. Uh, but TC mirroring is yet another uh, implementation of this. So um, when you run Kata Container, you can, on, on your host, you can specify uh, 
with what kind of networking bridge implementation you want to use. And with 1.4.0, you'll be able to select one more uh, interface, one more implementation of this bridge. I hope it makes sense. Not sure. <laughs> Um, and here in, in performance, I'm, I'm also mentioning uh, Nemu, uh, which is again the uh, the, the, the stripped down uh, version of QMU that um, that Kata Containers is, is able to use. Um, Nemu was built with security in mind. Uh, we're, with Nemu, we're trying to drastically reduce the the attack surface of, of QMU, and by doing so, we are uh, simplifying the whole. Um, um, hypervisor device model that Kata Container is using. So with Nemu, the, the Kata Container uh, workload is going to see a lot less devices. It's, it's not going to see any of the legacy devices. Um, typically, it will, with Nemu, you go from more than 200 devices that the, the, the container workload would see in the Kata Container virtual machine with QMU down to around 40 devices. So that simplifies thing that brings uh, uh, a lot smaller uh, tax surface, but it has a, a very nice uh, side effect as well, is that when you boot a virtual machine that has 40 devices instead of uh, 250, it boots faster. So um, just by using Nemu, vanilla Nemu, without any optimization, uh, we get better boot time um, just by simplifying the, the whole device model in the, in the, in the hypervisor. So that's a, perf a performance improvement as well. And um, Finally, the one that we are actually really looking forward to to be integrating, and this is this is a work in progress. I don't even have an ETA for this. Um, currently, we're using when you're not using a block-based device for your host uh, for for the for the place where your container workloads are stored. Um, you can either use a block-based device backend or an overlay backend. Uh, when you use a, when you use an overlay backend, we're going to use uh, what we call 9PFS, which is a virtualized implementation of the 9P file system. And it works okay. Um, but it has two very big, <laughs> very big drawbacks. It's slow, and it's not fully POSIX compliant. It's pretty big drawbacks. So when you use uh, 9PFS, um, you're going to end up having very, uh, well, not very, but poor performance in terms of I.O. So we strongly advise for uh, using a, a, a block-based device backend when you when you deploy Kata containers in in production, if you wanna if you wanna see um, much better performance, uh, so you you're gonna have poor performance and in some cases your workload are not gonna be able to run because you if your workload access do some very specific uh, file system related operation 9pfs won't support it, so. We're looking for a replacement for 9PFS, and this is something we are currently working with, uh, working on with uh, Red Hat, and we're working on a fuse-based uh, virtualized file system implementation. So we're not trying to implement uh, a specific file system uh, specification, but we're really virtualizing the, the file system operation through Fuse and Vertio. It's it's a relatively complex um, implementation, but it's. From the prototype that we're seeing, we're, we, we're having much better performance and a full POSIX compliance. So it's very interesting to us uh, because it will allow us to say you can deploy Kata containers in production on overlay or, or device mapper or whatever uh, backend you want to use for your container workloads and volumes. So this is, a, this is a, something that we really much are looking forward to integrate into, into Kata. And finally, uh, multi-architecture. As I said, um, back then, before Kata containers, when Kata containers were either RunV or Click containers, uh, I was on the Click container side. And every time I was presenting Click containers, people were really excited about it. But when they realized it was an Intel project, they were kind of thinking, oh, I'm going to be locking myself into a vendor, uh, Intel. I like Intel, but I understand people don't want to be luck to it. So one really important thing we wanted to, to add with uh, Kata Containers is multi-architecture support and really show that the, it's not bound to any, any instruction set or any uh, hardware virtualization specific implementation. So you can run Kata Containers on ARM on x86, 
on Power, um, no, not on Power, but on, on P series, on on PPC64. So this was a really important step for us. And uh, with 1.0, we we already had ARM64 support. So ARM is a contributor a contributor to uh, to Kata. So we really have native and and fully full full support for uh, for ARM64 on Kata containers. And with <coughs> With 1.1, we added uh, support for another architecture, PPC64. Um, and people are chiming in and adding more architecture support to, to this. It's, when you want to, uh, if, you, if you maintain an architecture that is not one of those and you want to add that to Kata containers, um, it's basically adding hypervisor support for your, for your architecture. So if your architecture uh, is supported by QMU, you will be very easily adding uh, support for your architecture into, into Kata container. So yeah, it's all designed to, to be a welcoming uh, architecture into, into Kata containers. OK, so that was the uh, technical side of things. Um, I also want to briefly mention the more uh, community um, part of Kata containers. Uh, initially, well, Click Containers was Intel. RunV was, was Hyper. And yeah, the contribution were pretty much either Intel or Hyper. Um, and I just want to describe and explain how this has uh, changed over time. So as I said initially, and, and one, if you look at the 1.0 contribution, it's probably 99% Intel or Hyper, um, because we were just the two companies trying to merge everything into, into a 1.0 release. But after that, we've, we're starting to see uh, other contributors chiming in. Um, silicon vendors. Um, Huawei, ARM, IBM, even NVIDIA contributed to, to Kata containers. Um, OSVs, uh, so SUSE, Red Hat, and Oracle have been contributing to, uh, been contributing to, to Kata containers and are, are contributing uh, for many reasons. Um, but it's very nice to see that because we went from a clear containers or RunV to a, an open stack, uh, pilot project, um, backed project, contribution just started chiming in because people are more confident when they see that this project is not bound to any specific company. It's, it's actually backed up by a neutral foundation that can keep the project afloat even if one of those companies actually leaves and decide that the project is not relevant anymore. So this really changed the, the whole contribution scheme uh, when we moved to Click containers, uh, run V to Kata containers. There's an architecture committee that make very big decisions on uh, Kata containers. It's actually not true. We we don't we don't make that many decisions. It's uh, yeah. The community actually handles that very nicely. Yes. You're <laughs> I'm what? No, no, not fine. You missed Eric. That's that's the previous architecture oh. committee. Yes. So the architecture committee is pretty much useless. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, <laughs> the community is just handling everything by themselves, which is which I'm really happy about. I just, yeah, I'm, this is very nice. Yeah, trust me, you don't have to spend all your time, you know, looking at PRs and issues and stuff. People are just handling that by themselves. So this was the first architecture committee that uh, got brought up when 1.0 was out. Uh, with people from Microsoft, Google, Intel, Huawei, and, and Hyper. Uh, and as scheduled, we had uh, another round of election with three seats out of the five uh, being uh, set for re-election. And we now have a new uh, architecture committee um, with Eric and John um, that joined this, this architecture committee. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's, uh, the process is just moving on. Uh, election went really fine. We had uh, more than 50 people that were eligible to vote. So one really important thing for, uh, for Kata containers and I think for most of the pilot project under the OpenStack Foundation is that you don't, you don't pay to play. You don't, you don't bring your money and just have a seat on the board or the architecture committee, or you don't pay and then you can vote for the architecture committee, which is pretty much the same thing. Um, the way this works is that you, you don't vote if you don't contribute. So if you don't contribute in a, in, a, in a meaningful way, you're not allowed to vote for the architecture committee. 
and architecture committee members are themselves contributors. So this is a, this is a very uh, refreshing way of, uh, of handling a project as part of a, one of those foundations, and it's very healthy. So by the time we had the second round of elections, um, we had 50 people that were eligible to vote. So 50 people that, uh, in our metrics, were um, had contributing in a, in a meaningful way to the project and were allowed to vote. Um, I also want to mention that uh, how the project actually influenced the uh, the rest of the container ecosystem. Um, we had some interesting discussion in the in the previous session where we're talking about all the components of Cata containers and uh, why they exist and. For many, of the, for many of them, they exist because we're trying to stuff a virtual machine into an ecosystem that is absolutely not virtual machine aware. That is, they live in their own world in the container ecosystem and they make strong assumptions on what a container is. And before Cata Containers, before making that a neutral project with, uh, that is backed up by many companies, um, we, and I spent around, almost two years trying to talk to specification bodies, uh, Kubernetes, uh, SIGs, uh, Docker, and all those people trying to say, you know, a container is not necessarily just a process that runs on the host and that isolated through namespaces. It can be something else. It can be a virtual machine. It can be a process running inside a hardware virtualized enclave. Um, not a lot of people were listening to me, uh, but when you go and talk with the Kata containers hat, things change and you get a lot more influence, which is, which is very healthy as well. So beside the many presentations that we did uh, at major conferences, um, thanks to Kata containers and thanks to how the project grown and, and evolved, we are able to be seen as a reference implementation for a very important work for us in, that, that took part of, uh, uh, of, of Kubernetes uh, runtime SIG, which is defining a runtime class. It, it may sound minor, but for us it's very important to say uh, container runtime is just, it's not just Docker. It's not just run C. Container runtime can be a lot of things, and we're gonna define a set of classes for runtimes. So you can have runtime for running your untrusted workload. You can have runtime for doing whatever you want, but you define your class of runtime and you make Kubernetes aware of this. So this is a big shift for us. It's going from Kubernetes being talking directly to Docker, which was, which was what, what was happening back in 1.3, 1.4. Now we're at the point where Kubernetes is saying, we're runtime agnostic. And we saw runtime agnostic that you can define the class of runtime that you want to use. If you want to use a VM-based runtime, then you just can go and define that, and Kubernetes is aware of this. So Kubernetes itself is saying, Containers are no longer just processes running inside namespace. Container can be whatever the runtime defines. So this, this change, thanks to projects like Kata Containers and also GVisor, um, and this is, uh, this is a very, very healthy change for us. It makes our life a lot easier. Um, we also changed the OCI specification. Um, OCI is the Open Container Initiative. If you run a container in your in your cluster, it's very, very likely that it complies with this specification. So all the Docker container, all the Kubernetes container, they all are complying with, with OCI. And OCI, the same way, is, OCI was also making all, all those assumptions about what a container is. And we, uh, we influenced this, uh, this specification to the point where now you can specify, as part of the OCI specification, which kernel you're gonna run inside your virtual machine if your container is running inside a virtual machine. So the concept of running a container inside a virtual machine is now part of the OCI specification, which is the, the foundation for all container runtimes. And that also, we tried to push this for, I think, 18 months, this, this PR was? 490 days. <laughs> 490 days, without any feedback from the OCI folks until we said, oh, they, they heard about Kata containers, and they knew what Kata containers, and they heard about the, the traction behind the project, and they realized that they had to do something to cover for <coughs> containers that are kind of like Kata containers. So we worked with them, and this PR got magically merged into the specification 
uh, once catechin was born. And that's all I had. Um, that's all I have. So I, I don't know if there are any questions, uh, comments. It was I hope things were clear. Yes. Uh, just a question about uh, how is it like different? So, so the question is, uh, how do we compare CATA containers with uh, with Qbert? Um, Qbert is uh, the the simple answer is is completely different, and uh, <laughs> the more detailed answer is that Qbert. For those who are not aware of, of what Qbert is, Qbert is a way for running a legacy virtual machine uh, inside your Kubernetes cluster. So you have a you have a virtual machine that your uh, company has been running for uh, 15 years, and no one wants to break that monolith into microservices and containerize all of this because it's making a lot of money. That's the typical use case. And so, but you still want to trans transition into transition your infrastructure from whatever you were running to Kubernetes. So, Kubert is a way to take this very old virtual machine that you don't want to touch and make that run as part of your uh, of your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so those are completely different use cases because Kubert really tells Kubernetes, I'm going to run a virtual machine, and this is a completely different resource uh, that's handled completely differently with a, its own life cycle and, and really virtual machine specific stuff. We, Kata Containers, make sure that Kubernetes does not know that we are a virtual machine. We don't want it to know that we are a virtual machine. We want it to believe that we are a container because we want to be treated as a container. Um, so it's, it's very different. We are running cloud-native application, containers, containerized application, whereas Kubert is really for legacy, um, big monolith virtual machine that you want to run as part of your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Yes, another question. Um, maybe it's not a good idea, but is it possible to do live migration of a Kata container? So the question is, uh, is it possible to do live migration with Kata containers? And um, you said that it was not a good idea, but I, I, I kind of agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so when people hear about virtual machine, uh, they want to do live migration. Uh, it's, it's one of the nice features of virtual machine. One of the nice features of QMU, you can do live migration. But it's kind of uh, antinomic with, uh, with the containers. If you want to do live migration with containers, you probably have not understood what a container is. <laughs> so we don't support live migration. We don't have plans to support live migration. And most importantly, Kubernetes does not support live migration. So we won't support live migration until Kubernetes supports live migration. And I think Kubernetes will never support live migration. <laughs> if you want to migrate to your container workload, you just kill your container and restart it somewhere else. That's the whole paradigm of uh, containers. So. Uh, but that's, that's really of course, it's possible. It's a, it's a virtual machine, so technically we could do it. Uh, in practice, we don't want to support this. Live migration is a complex stuff, very difficult. Uh, just one more thing, if you want to do the live migration, pay attention to the, the storage part. It's actually if you use the 9PFS. Yes, yeah. yeah, live migration with 9PFS. Yeah, yeah. If, if, you, if you don't use 9PFS, instead you use some networking share file system, network storage and uh, properly deal with the, the connect the resource connection and uh, I think that is possible that, that's possible to, to do that. And if you, if you do that um, I, I I personally I it's welcome to contribute to that. I, I will personally block it. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, if you, I, yeah, I, I don't advise for doing live migration with containers. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's a virtual machine, and you can, in theory, you could do live migration. Yeah, yeah that, that's part of our, our community because here. If, if two, two major maintainers, yeah. that's, that, that's good. And before, before he read the main plan, we have two plus plus. <laughs> 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 Any more questions? So the question is, uh, can, I, can, can one take a regular container workload without rebuilding it and running it with Kata containers? And the answer is yes. 
And if, um, if you have to rebuild it, then we have a bug. So you should not have to rebuild any of your container workload for running Kata containers. It's a really important feature that you can run your Docker uh, workload that has been for been running in your in your uh, Docker deployment, Docker-based deployment, and this is going to run with Kata containers. So we are running internally the top I don't know 100 or I, I don't know can't remember which number, but we're making sure that the most popular container workloads are always running with with Kata containers as is, without, without having to be uh, rebuilt. There, there, there's some exceptions. If, if you want to have the Docker.com, yeah. uh, the, the Docker yeah. into the, into the container. But it's not related to the, to the container itself. You, you don't, so if you want to do, uh, do host resources manipulation, so if you want to get direct access to, the, to your host networking, for example, uh, this is not going to be supported with, with Kata containers. And it's independent from the container workload itself. It's yeah. just that you won't be able to reach your host namespace from, your, from the virtual machine. So there are use cases that we don't support, but it's not related to the workload itself. We don't have to rebuild. You can rebuild the workload. If you want to get access to your host namespace, uh, you can rebuild the workload the way you want. It's, it's never going to work. So that's, that's a different story. There are use cases that we, we don't want to support. Um, and if you, if you want to do host namespace manipulation, for example, uh, you you're doing something that is completely orthogonal to what Kata Container is trying to do, so you're not doing something secure. Um, so you don't want to run that through, through Kata Containers. Um, but yeah, that's independent from, from the workload itself. And if you are running a, a, a container uh, workload that is not supported by Kata Containers, you please open an issue in, on, on Kata Containers GitHub. It, this, should, this is a bug on our side. So the question is uh, about the, the OCI specification. And uh, uh, I mentioned that part of the OCI spec now is letting you specify the kernel that you're going to run inside the, inside the virtual machine. And the question is, uh, isn't that part of the build process? The, 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 when you build a container workload, you, don't, you, you only specify what your user space is going to look like, so what your container workload itself is going to look like. Um, and you don't specify that as part of the OCI specification. The OCI specification only lets you say, I want to run this specific binary as my init command uh, on, on the container. And the build process is completely different. So you, you never specify a kernel or a guest image in, as part of the build process. What you do when you, the kernel and the, and, the, and the guest image are runtime, uh, uh, runtime entities. So this is what you run when you start your container workload. But it, it's not part of the container workload itself. So you specify, as part of the OCI specification, you give a specific path to a kernel, which is going to be your, your guest kernel. But it's only used when you run your container workload. And you can use the same container workload on, on completely different kernels. So you can use, you don't have to rebuild it. Some more questions? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It's, uh, you don't, the kernel and, and guest path, the, the, the root FS basically, uh, those are optional in the OCI specification. If you don't specify any of those, Kata containers will try to find a default one on the host. So when you install Kata container, you, it comes with a, a default w good working uh, uh, kernel for, for Kata containers. So you don't need to specify one. But if you want to use an alternative, alternative <laughs> kernel that you have installed on the host, you can do that through the OCI specification. Anything else? Hmm? Well, thank you. <laughs>